Welcome to Riverside Bible Church Wednesday night Bible study. We're glad that you're tuning in from wherever you might be across the country. Please take your Bibles, turn to the book of Jude. The book of Jude. Did you get a chance to read that this week, folks? Yes. Uh, <laughs> we're going to look at this whole chapter, so we're going to take it pretty much verse by verse. Uh, it's a fairly small uh, chapter, 25 verses. Uh, we'll link some of the verses together, but uh, but we'll talk about it. We'll talk about who Jude is. We'll talk about what the message is here in the book. And then we'll look at some of these messages that he has to say. Because one of the uh, we're, we're going to see what the importance of the whole book is. And uh, we're going to talk about contending for the faith. Uh, we're going to talk about false teachers. We've, we've got quite a Bible uh, lesson from Jude uh, as far as this Old Testament scriptures uh, about these false teachers and uh, how how he took this very personal. And I think we should too. And uh, but let's uh, let's look at Jude. First of all, the author of the book, his name is Jude, and. And uh, not all of the books are titled after themselves, but Peter and John and some of these are. But Ephesians, it's about the Ephesians, and the Romans, about the Romans, and uh, that kind of thing. And so but this is Jude, the author of the book, and he is the half-brother of Jesus. Now, his mom and dad is Mary and Joseph. So how can he be the half-brother of Jesus? <laughs> Joseph is not the biological father of Jesus. What was done of Mary was of the Holy Ghost. He has no earthly father. If he had an earthly father, what would that mean? Just like every one of us, right? So it had to be someone that was different without sin uh, in order to be the perfect lamb. So that was Jesus' half-brother. And uh, so uh, and we find that in a couple places. In Matthew 13, we have a listing of uh, the records of the brothers of Jesus, and it mentions James and Judas, which is, this is who this is. The American version changed his name over to Jude, shortened it up, which they do that from time to time, but maybe just to keep him from being named along with Judas Iscariot, which is who they would certainly not want him to be named after. But there were a lot of Judases in the uh, scriptures, uh, their names uh, and things, but anyways, that's who Jude is, and um, he was a follower. He was not a follower of Jesus until after what? The crucifixion. All right, the resurrection. Until after the resurrection. Listen, what do you think all of the disciples were thinking in the upper room? After Jesus was crucified, buried, the stone rolled up, it's being guarded, it's, it's been sealed. What do you think they were thinking uh, when they gathered together before Jesus appeared to them? It's over. It's over. Did we get it right there? Did we? Yeah. What? Yeah. Well, uh, what? Where do we go from here? Uh, this is not the outcome they anticipated, even though Jesus kept telling them he must go to the cross. And uh, Peter was even trying to rebuke him from going to the cross. Right after uh, he told uh, Peter that uh, flesh and blood had not revealed who I am to you, but that's a, a, a God the Father. And then he turns around and says, get behind me, Satan, because you savor not the things of God. Because he didn't want... Jesus to go to Jerusalem, and he didn't want him to be uh, go to the cross, and because they certainly didn't understand all of those things. But, anyways, you remember when he went to his hometown, even his own family just you know could not believe that this is the carpenter's son, this is Mary and Joseph's boy. There's no way this can be the Messiah, and so he couldn't do a lot of miracles there because of their unbelief. You remember that scripture. And uh, so, anyways, Judas, uh, or Jude was part of that, and James as well, and others. But after the resurrection, you think about this now. After the resurrection, when you have seen the nail prints out of that, we can talk about Thomas all we want, but I'll guarantee you, every one of them needed to see it, right? They needed to know that Jesus didn't have a twin. Right? <laughs> they needed to see the nail prints, the scar in the side. They needed to look and 
listen and talk to and know that this was Christ. But once they got a hold of Jesus alive, after he was crucified and died, after he was buried, and he comes up just like he said, and as he began to, to enlighten them about the very scriptures he had been teaching them about, because he was with them for how many days after his resurrection? Anybody remember? 40. 40. 40. 40 days, and at one time he was seen among 500. Brother. So it wasn't just like you got off in the corner with his disciples. It was a lot of people that seen him alive. You think his mother? Mm -hmm. well, yeah. yeah. yeah he, 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 I'm sure he went to a lot, a lot of people during that time uh, before his ascension up into glory. So when they saw him, Dan, go ahead. You had something. Well, if he went through his mother, then he went to Judah. Right. 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 Right? So, you know, Jude, James, all the brothers, and his sisters, he had half sisters too, all of them, then once they got hold of a resurrected Christ, things were different for them. Was it different for Peter? Morning. He became a different man, didn't he? You know, the, the scriptures say that the gifts of the Spirit, you know, it, it's uh, faith. And and uh, I don't think John needed to see the nail prints in the hand because he believed no matter what. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that it does something to see the resurrected Lord. Uh, it changed them forever. And guess what? You can say, because I didn't see him, I don't believe, but you weren't going to change their mind. They became eyewitnesses to the resurrection. You remember we talked about that when we were, we discussed, when we were talking about Paul and, and Acts and all of that, is that the reason they are all willing to now die for the cause of Christ, not just Peter opening his big mouth at, at the Last Supper saying, oh, well, everybody else, oh, I'll, I'll die for you. And then that very night, he denied three times he even knew who Jesus was. But now he's seen the resurrected Lord. Now he's gotten in light of what's going on. Now he's got it in here and not just here. And he's a different man. And we see his life. You know, he was so bold in the beginning, but always opening his mouth and inserting foot. You know, about a lot of things. But you see as he got older and as he got more mature in the Lord, we see him in one occasion in the book of Acts where they're talking about different things that's going on between the Jews and the Gentiles and different things. And Peter's sitting there listening. He's listening very intently. And when they all got through speaking, then he gave some words of wisdom. Listen, we've seen a different man. We've seen a man that's growing up in the Lord. And uh, so they were all different. But listen, all of them died martyrs' deaths with the exception of John, who was boiled to be boiled to death, but he didn't die. So then they put him on the Isle of Patmos, and there he gets to pen the book of Revelation. Ends up dying of natural causes off of that isle. But listen, they were all willing. Peter did, not willing to be crucified right side up. He was crucified upside down. He not worthy to be crucified like his Lord. Well, that don't sound like the guy warming himself at the end of his fire back when Jesus was captured, does it? So, the resurrection made a change in them all. A change that no one could take from them. Listen, let me tell you something. When you have become a product of a new birth, and you understand what that is, and you believe the scriptures, like my, like my uh, new grandson in law, when he got saved, he picked the Bible up and he put it up to his chest and he said, Lord, I don't even know if I'm saying this right, but I believe every word that's in this book. Ah, when you get that and you believe that, and then by faith you believe what took place on the cross and the resurrection, and you become born again, we may make some mistakes along the way, but I'm going to tell you something. The world didn't give it to you, and the world can't take away what you know. That's why it's important that you know what you know what you know. And it's not by a feeling. 
It's by what you know. You live by what you know. Now, is it a good feeling to know your name's written on the Lamb's Book of Life and you're on your way to heaven? Absolutely. Is it a good feeling to be around God's people and share like this in God's Bible study and, and His Word and the preach Word all of a sudden sing praises to His name together? Yeah, yeah. All of that feels good. It's great. But I, I, I got to admit, I don't always feel like jumping a pew and swinging from the chandeliers every day. Sometimes I just don't feel like that. But does that mean I'm not saved then? Because I have a ways to jump there with them. Uh, that I would, I, I, that I'm not saved on those days. No, it doesn't, because I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that He is able to keep that which I've committed unto Him against that day. Right. So this is this is so when Jew got a hold of it, and he got the, after the resurrection, he kind of nailed it down. And listen, when he got it. He became a believer and, a, and was very powerful in his faith in Jesus Christ. Jude is so important because of the things that it covers. In the first four verses, we kind of have a greeting and a purpose of this book. So when we have a greeting that, like verse 2 that says, Mercy and peace and love. Who understands those words? Only the believers. <laughs> really, truly, the believers understand. We understand what mercy is all about. We understand what peace is all about. My peace I give unto you, not as the world give I unto you, the Lord said. Love, love like none ever before, an unconditional love by the Lord Jesus, by God, given his only begotten Son. So he's given us an introduction. The servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, that makes him the half-brother of Jesus as well, to them that are sanctified by the God the Father, preserved in Jesus Christ, and called. That's kind of nailing it down too. And then verse 3, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to his, this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. I know what that word means? It does. It means a very shameful immorality. And, and it denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. What to do? Earnestly contend for the faith. Earnestly means it's serious and it's important that we contend for the faith. Why? Because certain people have secretly slipped in here. And in, in verse 4, he's talking about, he's appealing to those that are sanctified by God the Father to understand that these are false teachers that have crept in among us. To Jew, this was personal. You know what? It should be personal to us too as born again children of God. How do we, how do we contend for the faith? What does that mean to you? Judas, uh, Jew here is what we would call in our, our, not so much today, but in our earlier days of our lives, it's what we would call a hellfire and brimstone preacher. Anybody ever remember preachers being called that? These are hellfire and brimstone. He's one of those. This Book of Jude is a hellfire and brimstone message uh, to the church and uh, and to those false teachers. Well, contend means to fight for. Okay. If you're going to be a boxing match, they say these are the contenders. All right. So how do we contend for the faith? Okay. How do we fight for it? Put the gloves on. First of all, you've got to live right. Yeah, fight the devil. Yeah. Okay. How do we fight the devil? Standing in truth. Yeah. All right. How, what, what do we, how, 
how, how are we to arm ourselves? Armor of God. Okay, the whole armor of God. All right, Dan? Yeah. I think prayer. Prayer is absolutely necessary. And uh, uh, contending for the faith is striving. Just get in the Word and strive for the, the knowledge of God because we can't uh, we can't fight the devil. It, it's up to the Lord and through His Word. Go ahead. Let's think what a lot of people think this means is to always be verbal about your faith. To stand up and fight with people about what's right and wrong with you. But I don't think that that's necessarily what this means. I think it means, it has a deep root, brother, do you? I don't think it means to always be like the street corner preacher out there giving everybody home by a person. No, I do think there are times that, and especially in our day and age, uh, that kind of thing is, is, is not uh, tolerated and like it used to be. But there are, I think Jude is telling us that there are times that we do need to stand in that kind of fashion and just stand firm when others are trying to run down the faith in God. But listen, I'm never going to contend for the faith until I know what I believe and it's backed by the word of God. I, listen, from, from the time I got saved, at 17 years old, knowing nothing about the scriptures, the one thing I did know is that when people would tell me what they believed, I wanted them to tell me what the scriptures said about it. I hear what you say about it, Connie, but I want to hear what the scripture says about it. And when they couldn't give me the scripture, I began to understand that a lot of people believe what they believe based on what someone else has told them, not what the scripture has told them because they can't go there. If you were going to tell somebody that they needed to be saved, what scripture would you use to show them that they need salvation? There's none good, no matter what. All right. There's none. It's not what it says, but that's close. There's none righteous. No, not one. Now, when I present that verse to someone, I include myself. No, not one. Not me, not you, not it. The only righteousness I have in me is Jesus Christ. So I, I don't, don't, I don't want to look down my nose at someone spiritually and make them think that I'm better than they are. Listen, the only difference between me and them is that I know Jesus and they don't. That's it. So we got to know what we believe. So if you tell somebody you believe Jesus died on the cross, you need to be able to go to the scriptures and show them where it says Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And if it's a sacrifice for the world, you need to be able to go tell them where it says in the scripture it's a sacrifice for the world. If you believe he rose from the dead, then you need to go to the scripture and show them where Jesus resurrected from the dead. You, what, what you believe you need to be able to back it by the word of God. Otherwise, how can you contend for the faith? I'll tell you what you'll end up doing. You'll end up giving your opinion versus their opinion. Everybody got a right to be wrong with their opinion. But you don't have any right to be wrong with the facts. Now, if somebody doesn't believe the word of God, that make it any less true. Because all I'm going to give you is what's in here. So if you don't believe it, then I can help you because every question you ask me, if I can contend for it and I'm going to I'm going to have my stand on it, it's going to come from this book. Where are you going? Where are you going to stand on your belief? Oh, I don't believe that Bible's true. Okay, well, this Bible tells me it's true. So where do you? What what do you have to back up? It's not true. I, you know, listen, don't be afraid to contend for the faith, but you best know that you know that you know, and what you believe needs to be found in here. You know, I've given the illustration all, so many times about my mom saying, the Bible says the Lord helps those who help themselves. Well, until I read it through, it's not in there. And when I read it through there, and I told my mom, she still didn't believe it. Right? 
So many times, listen, we simply believe because we were taught it from our parents or from our church or from our Sunday school teacher and we latched onto it and we never, ever went to the scripture to find out if it's so or not. Now, listen, people said, listen, do you think that's a good principle? The Lord tells those who help themselves. And there's times that I can't help myself and the Lord helps me. So it's not just contingent on me helping myself, but there's a, there's a good principle there. And listen, uh, and a lot of people say things to you as if it was scripture. They might even talk in scripture form, like thou shalt or thou shalt not. You know, they might even make it sound scriptural, even though that whole a new uh, a new English King James or an NIV or some other translation, but when they want to share something with you, they speak in the King James. Right? <laughs> uh, so, listen, uh, if I'm going to contend for the faith and stand firm on what I believe, I need to know what I believe. If you are only going to believe what well, I'm going to tell you from the pulpit on Sunday and what I'm going to tell you from, from this pulpit on Wednesday, you're not going to get much. Not that I'm not going to give you scriptures. And listen, anybody wants to come up after any service, here or here, and want to know what scriptures I use, and it, it's all in my notes here, I'll be glad to share it with any of you. You can go look these up yourself. And many times I say, it's in this scripture, you need to write that down and go look it up. But listen, it's because you can't depend on me. One of these days, now I, yeah, I might as well take it out. One of these days, I'm going to give you something that is scripture. And I'm going to just see who catches it. <laughs> I'll tell you what I did. We were going through a, a study at a church. I was teaching an adult Sunday school class there. And we were going through a study on the purpose-driven life. Anybody ever went through that study? Yeah. Okay. That study had so many translations in it, and they were all referenced in the back of the book. Carol and I sat down at the computer one night, and we looked up every translation. We found that it was from one guy just sat down and wrote his version to, you know, a handful of people, none of them with original writings, of course, and, and everybody, it almost was like every one of these translations was almost a paraphrase of two or three people. But you know what? When you're doing a book and you want things to rhyme and you want things to say the way you want it to be said, you just keep looking through enough translations or just write your own. But what is the danger of that? You can change. You change a word or a phrase and you can change a lot. We've got to be careful. So, I went back to my Sunday school class and I read them some things out of the Catholic Bible. And I read it just like it was King James. Just like it was normal scripture that we have. And I just read some things out and they all just said, not it, not it, not it. I said, everybody agree with that? Everybody agree with that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, anybody want to know where that come from? Even the Catholic Bible, does that bother anybody? They were all like, don't. Oh. Listen, folks, don't. You can't go by me. You can't depend on, I hope you can depend on me, but listen, you know what I'm saying. Don't put all your eggs in my basket. How many, how many people like, uh, oh boy, I get in trouble tonight. How many people are in, in Kenneth Copeland's basket? <laughs> Listen, believe in every word this man says as gospel, but yet he can be found to be a liar in many scriptures. But when they're locked in, they just, he's the man, right? He's not the man. He's the man. We've got to be careful 
We need to contend for the faith by knowing what we believe according to the scriptures. Paul said, uh, if any man thinks he stands, take heed that lets him fall. Miles. That's not where I thought you were going, but that's a good one. Well, you you got to be. Here's, here's, here's what Paul said. If I or an angel of God bring you any other gospel, it is to be rejected. That's where we stand on by knowing. If I don't know what it says, how can I reject it? Because I don't even know what it says. You tell me it's true, I don't believe it. No! I need to look it up for myself. If I'm going to stand on it, I best know what it says. Listen, you go to court of law. You better have your ducks in a row. You better have your facts. You better have it lined up. You better have the ins and outs of everything. When they put you on the stand and they start grilling you with the questions, you better know where you stand and what your story is, and you better know what's truth about it. If you're telling a lie, you're going to get tripped up. You're going to get turned around. You're going to get twisted. And if you don't know half of what you say is true, maybe somebody just told you and that's all you know, you're going to get turned around every which way but loose. Listen, it's the exact same thing happens when people are trying to contend for the faith, but they know not what the scriptures say. Now, am I talking about memorizing the word of God? No. No. But we could be a lot better at it than we are. So, here we got Jude he is not going to waste. <laughs> we got 25 verses. He says more in these 25 verses than most people can put in books. He says, I'm not going to waste time nor space dancing around this issue of exposing these false teachers and standing firm on the faith. I'm not going to do it. Verses 5 through 16, he exposes these false teachers. Doom is certain. And nobody likes to hear that today, do they? Look at verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this. this man, he's hammering them right off the bat. You already know this. You once knew it, and now you just let it slip. You just let everything idly go by. Instead of standing up for what's right, you just let these people come in and do their own thing. But know this. How that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Do you think everyone that came out of Egypt with the children of Israel were believers? No, they weren't. And did every one of them make it to the promised land? No, they did not. Now he's going to give quite a list here of things of the Old Testament. That happened that showed that these things happened because nobody was willing to take a stand for what was right. And he starts out with, look, he says, the angels. And verse 6, were in their first estate, they left it. They didn't keep it. They left on their own habitation. And guess what? They're reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until the judgment of the great day. Now, I don't know what all that means, but I know this. When the devil revolted and he took a bunch of the angels with him, listen, he didn't just take them and they go fly around the world. This says he took them and he bound them up. A stand was taken. You can't just go against God and it'll be all right. No, yeah, just, yeah, you, yeah, just go do whatever you want. It doesn't work like that. He goes then on the side of the morning. Listen, we can talk all day about homosexuality and what's right or wrong about it and all of these things. But listen, it plainly says going after strange flesh and that this was done as an example. God will not tolerate this behavior. Now, is, is uh, homosexuality the only sin that God won't tolerate? No, absolutely not. I think we spend maybe a little too much time hammering that, but listen, there's a lot of other, are you a liar? Are you a thief? Are you a robber? 
Are you just simply an unbeliever? Listen, God ain't going to tolerate that either. Sodom and Gomorrah, man. And then he talks about these filthy dreamers who defile the flesh, despising dominion and speaking evil of dignities. They do not, uh, they do not accept authority, not only local authority, but higher powers. Then I'm going to listen to the laws of it. Listen, our, our law officers today don't know how to carry on their jobs anymore. Because of what is accepted and not accepted. What would you do if you were a police officer and somebody was running at you with a knife? Would you defend yourself? Today, if you do, and it, and it costs them their lives, then what? But listen, Jude's talking about his day. We got it going on today, too. These dreamers, these filthy dreamers, listen, we are almost like the days of Noah. But didn't Jesus say that's what it would become to? We would be like the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, even the imagination of man's heart was on evil continually. You think we live in an evil society? There are sick people in this world that are just demon-possessed, just living for the devil, just outright. And these are filthy dreamers, defile the flesh, despise dominion, despise authority, and dignitaries, and they speak evil of them. Oh, if the president goes their way, they're all for it. But if he doesn't, or if something doesn't go their way, here goes, like, let's just burn down a store or two. Let's tear down a town. Let's, listen, they got no respect for authority. Who do you think they mean by the glorious ones? Which verse? In verse 8. They reject authority and blaspheme the glorious ones. Is that mm. historical religious figures? Is that angel? Is that well, my scripture, my Bible doesn't say that. It says, "Speak evil, evil of dignities." And that's that's. It says in my Bible, "My Majesty." So uh, it certainly could be that higher power, something spiritual. Mine says Jesus. they're angels. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there Mine you says go. angels. There you go. Then look at uh, verse 9. Michael the archangel contending over the body of Moses. Even he said to the devil, look, God rebuked you. The Lord rebuked you. You do not get this body. You're not more powerful than God and he sent me for this body. You're not getting it. Verse 10 tells you just exactly what they become. They speak evil of those things which they know not. How many people are just speaking out today and just out of ignorance? Mm -hmm. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them. For they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the terror of Balaam for reward and perished in the game saying of Corinth. Listen, there's three good ones right there. What was the problem with Cain? Let's just start there. He did what he wanted, not what God said. Did he know the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. How did he know the right thing to do? He looked confused. Why is it my offering being accepted like Abel's offering was accepted? They all were. But, uh, <laughs> He went after his own. If Cain had just offered the sacrifice that God had set up for them to offer, he could have easily, after that, offered the sacrifice of his first fruits, of his, and, and, been, and been accepted, not kind of pleased with that. You take that off, that, that's great. But you stay within obedience to what I've already commanded you to do. Now, because he didn't, what did, what did God tell him? 
You know the right thing to do. And if you don't do it, what's lying at his door? Sin. Sin's lying at your door. What was the sin lying at his door? What did he commit? Murder. Murder. He murdered his own brother. And his blood cried out to God. And guess what? Did God say, oh, well, you know, people make mistakes. We're doing the same thing today, though. He said, that I don't, I don't think we need that all that blood. Let's just take all the songs and things with blood out of us. We don't need that blood. Anything they don't understand, that's what they were doing. That's why we contend for the faith. And that's why we have to know what the Bible says about the blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is what? No remission for sin. You take the blood out, you take out the forgiveness, the remission of sin, you get our sins forgiven. You take away the cross. There remaineth no more sacrifice. Before he was charged with murder, he was self-willed because he wanted to get his own sacrifice price because, you know, that's what started it all. Right. But the point I'm making here is that God contended for the faith, for what was right. And he stood on it. And a mark came. And he sent him away with that mark on him that everybody that saw him would leave him alone. But he was going to live a vagabond the rest of his life. God did not wink at his murder of his brother because he could have done the right thing. He knew the right thing. He chose not to do the right thing. And God did not take it lying down. What about, what was the next one? Uh... Balaam, the greed of Balaam. We, it's interesting that we haven't preached on Balaam, but we have mentioned Balaam probably two or three times in these Bible studies mm -hmm. because we, we, we've been going through the book of Judges. And so Balaam, you remember, he was going to go against God's will and go to Barak because he was going to give him a nice, plushy, cushion uh, uh, position and have more money and have all the prestige he wanted Barak would give it all to him if he would curse Israel, but God stopped him out. <laughs> stopped him through the talking of his own mule to him and then let him see the angel that was blocking the way. So the greediness, he's, re he's saying these are like the greediness. Listen, he was going to say, well, God told me don't go, but I'm going to go anyway. You can't. Without God standing up for that which is right. Where was everybody else? Everybody else should have stood up and said, Hey, you can't do that. He's in the enemy. You can't go curse Israel. This is God's people. What are you thinking? Instead, you know, they just. Well, Balaam even said, I'll, I'll go, but I'll always say what God tells me. He was willing to pull the wool over the king's eyes because he wasn't, he couldn't, he knew he couldn't curse Israel. Well, he already lied. He already lied because he didn't go tell him what God said. God said, don't go. He went. He said, well, let's go. Tomorrow morning, we'll go. We'll go. And the Lord let him go. But only so far before he cut it off. Now, what about the next one? The game saying the court. Anybody remember this story? The rebellion took the camp, right? That's right. The rebellion of, against the, uh, Moses and Aaron. You guys have taken on too much. You guys are, 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 are taking, listen, this sounds just like, this sounds just like churches today. That preacher is just doing too much. He's just taking on too much of He's just, he's just doing everything. None of us get a chance to do it. He's just doing all kinds of stuff that nobody even knows. I wonder what's going on in his house over there. Of course, that's why he was as good as Moses. That's right. He, he could we talk could to do God it. just like Moses. We'll take this over. We'll take this over from you, Moses. We'll take this over from you, Aaron. No, you won't. Because God won't stand for it. Listen, Moses didn't call himself. God called Moses. Aaron didn't call himself. God called Aaron. He didn't call Korah. And so Moses says... All right, Lord, well, don't destroy all, all of these people because of these knotheads. Let's just put these knotheads to the test. And so he did. 
And the God that opened up the ground and answered would be God, right? And the ground opened up and swallowed them alive. And then closed up over. Gone. Just like that. Jude ain't full of no punches. He's given it right from the scriptures. Right head on to these people who have laid down and let these false teachers waltz right in and start teaching things contrary to the Lord Jesus, whom he takes very personal, right? Because that's not only his half-brother, but now that's his Lord and Savior. He even goes on to say, Enoch prophesied of these things. He's spelling out what he thinks of these false teachers and daring to come against them. How dare you? This is where the church ought to be stronger today. How dare you come against God in this manner? How dare you tell us this book is not good enough? You guys remember Jim Jones? Took this book and said, don't need to listen to that anymore. You need to start listening to me. What? Who was not brave enough, smart enough, scriptural enough, spiritual enough to say, hold on, buddy. Who do you think you are? Now listen. Nobody likes that kind of talk. Nobody likes that kind of grip these days. But listen, Jude says there's times because you knew it. You knew it before and you just let it slide in. Don't make, don't ruffle anybody's feathers. Don't make anybody mad. I remember I was preaching in Ohio one time and just about the middle of the message, these two girls, these two, young ladies came in and they came in together and they come about halfway down and sit down for the and I just finished the message and when I got done with the message as they were walking out the door both of them accused me of changing my message to preach just to them <laughs> I said ma'am if that's true then we've had a great miracle here today because I've never seen you a day, a day in my life. I know nothing about you. And if God revealed that to me, we've had a miracle here this morning. Listen, people, no. You're not going to talk against this message that I had prepared not even knowing. How could I even know you would be in this service? <laughs> Listen, we've gotten away from just letting the chips fall where they may. If God puts something on your heart, then just preach it. But we have whole denominations that have moved away from the Word of God and said it isn't not modern enough. It, we need to change this. This is what the Jude's whole point. Yeah. Let me ask you this: Are we as a church rolling over and playing dead just a little too? Much. Stand up to that. How is that? I example. I had a, I eat lunch with a bunch of people I exercise with on Mondays and Fridays, and there's a lady that comes who is always pushing the envelope and wanting to talk about it. Um, Going to this place that's lascivious or doing that thing. And it's really hard for me to stand up against. I try to change the subject. I got to be left. I had, I told a joke today and she gave me, if I could, if looks could have killed, I'd have been dead. <laughs> <laughs> she gave me the dirty, and it was a silly joke because they were talking about one thing and I just told the joke about the policeman who pulled up behind a car and the lady was cussing the guy in front of her out one side down the other and the policeman turned on his lights and opened her door and handcuffed her and took her to jail. And she said, well, why'd you bring me down? He said, well, I thought you stole that car. And she said, why'd you say that? He said, well, your bumper sticker said, I love Jesus. 
So they didn't get that sense of humor. Well, this, everybody laughed at the table, but right. her, and she looked at me like I thought she'd be dead. <laughs> Here's the way I always felt about it, uh, Linda, is that if someone that I'm in a group with, and someone feels brave enough to talk against God in front of me, I always felt like I should be brave enough to talk about God in front of them. Uh, you guys, most of you guys know my Jehovah Witness story. I let the ladies in, and I asked them if they believed in prayer. Yes, they do. I said, I believe in prayer. One of us is wrong. You're wrong or I'm wrong. One of us is leading people the wrong way. And I'd rather be dead than to lead people to hell. And I said, so I knelt down at the coffee table in my living room, and I said, you kneel down here with me, and let's pray and ask God to kill one of us right now. <laughs> well, they jumped up and said, you're not praying for me. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, ladies, exit stays right because you just told me you don't really believe in what you're standing for. I do. I would I would just rather have God kill me here on the spot than to be leading people to hell and have to answer for that later down the road. And you said you believe your prayer, prayer and you believe that you're doing the right way. Well, you must not have believed it too well because you won't get down here and pray with me. Listen. I feel that way. I feel like there's times that maybe I should be quiet, and there's times I am. I, I had a, a friend who, every time he got around me, he knew I was a Christian, and I didn't swear and all that, but he his mouth was filthy. And Carol and I ran into him one day at, at Walmart, and he started, and the filthy mouth started. But God said, don't say nothing. And I did but what I noticed is, the longer we talked, the less he swore. And when we got through the conversation, he wasn't swearing at all. And when he walked away, I looked at Carol and I said, Did there something strange that just went on here? She goes, yeah. He quit cussing and we didn't <laughs> say a word. You know? So listen, sometimes you just have to be mindful of the Spirit of God. But I believe Jew under the direction of the Holy Spirit, is hammering these false teachers. Because, listen, it can be the difference of life and death. You let these false teachers get loose in our churches, and they'll destroy that church. Because it's of the devil. It's not of God. And so I think we, I think we do as churches lay down and play dead way too much. Worried about we're going to upset somebody or hurt somebody's feelings. Listen, I'm not out to hurt somebody's feelings. And I don't want to be a rude person. But I'm going to tell you, we're going to stand on the truth here. And we're going to stand on the Word of God. And we'll preach it straight. And we're going to give people an opportunity to respond to it. If somebody can't handle that, I can't help that. So we've got to stand and quit rolling over and playing dead. <coughs> The kind of language in our society today would be considered, this, this would be considered rude and unacceptable. You bring up all of these like Sodom and Gomorrah and Cain and Abel and Korah being swallowed up in the ground and all of these things. Listen, that would be unacceptable in many circles today that call themselves Christians. In many circles today, the forcefulness of Jew. They would tolerate it. They are looking for someone who will be a teacher having itching ears. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Say what they want to hear. Say what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. The crowds today are looking and prefer a softer, more gentle side of Christian faith. Is there a softer, more gentle side? Yes, there is. There is. Listen, but Jude reminds us that there is a time and a place for aggressive protection of the truth. How about Jesus? <laughs> Jesus have a soft side to him? Sure. Woman, where's your accusers? Neither do I with you. They go and sin no more. He is without sin. Let him cast the first stone. You, 
generation of vipers. You hypocrites. Yeah. You've made this house of prayer a den of thieves. Boom. Get out. You know, does anybody know what Jesus did when he ran them out of the temple? This doesn't get followed through. This is good. They brought all the sick to him and he healed them all. And one swoop, he ran out the money changers and brought in what the church was all about. You think Jesus did that in a soft fashion? Absolutely not. There are times you have to be strong and foregoing on standing on what is true and right. And don't back down from it. Amen. But Jesus went that way with every sinner, was he? No, he wasn't. There were times that he was more gentle. And more soft. And there were times he was very firm. So we take our we take ours from him, right? Look at verse 17. Because he's going to end this book by not only he's already given, he's going to give some warnings and he's going to give some commands to Christians. Look what he says in verse 17. But beloved, remember you the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last times, who should walk not, who should walk after their own, and listen to the ungodly, the ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, and of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. I want to write, there was a, a verse I wanted to read. Yes, verse 15. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly, among them all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches unto ungodly sinners have spoken against him. <laughs> uh, he, he was just on fire. But here in the 17 through 23, remember. Remember the words that were spoken to you by the prophets. And not only by the prophets, but how about the apostles who were before you who spoke uh, after the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember these words of how God told you how to live. How to do. And when these guys come in and tell you the opposite, you shut them down. Anybody know what necromancy is? What is it? Uh, it's calling up the dead. It's, it's dealing with the dead. There's a book out called Necromonicon, and that's how to call up the dead. And I was in a, I was in Kansas at a revival, and the pastor took me to a local bookstore to show me this book. And lo and behold, when you think this was coincidence, we get to the bookstore and we walk up to the book rack and a lady is holding the book, Necromonica, in her hand. I was like, what are we going to do? You know, he's like, I don't know, maybe we better leave. I said, we can't leave. She's got the book. <laughs> right? We can't leave. Listen, if you're not going to contend for the faith in such an instance as this, when are you? So I walk up to her and I said, Man, do you know what this book is that you're holding in your hand? And she had that book and she looked at me and she went, Oh, wow, man. That's what she said. And I said, Let me tell you something. That book is not for you. You need a Bible. You need the Word of God. This is not about, this is of the devil. You need to know about 
God. She took that book and she started walking around this bookstore going, oh, wow, man. Oh, wow, man. Now, now she put the book down and she left. But you know what? I'll never see her again, but I hope I'll see her in heaven. Because I hope being willing to contend for the faith, when it's right in your face, the devil says, what are you going to do now? I got somebody right here reading a book. The very book you're looking for. There, she's got it. What are you going to do? Walk away? Hope that she gets it right? No. No. There's times you just got to put your foot down and say, ma'am, you need to understand what this book is. It's of the devil. You need God. Well, this is what we're remembering. Remember what's right and wrong. Didn't we remember that? Don't you remember when all churches preached strong? They preached hard. They preached it straight. People didn't like it. They used to say, a dancing foot and a praying knee don't grow on the same leg. <laughs> right? Listen, it wasn't that something was wrong with dancing and something was wrong with praying and then you couldn't have one or the other. They were simply saying, look, be careful what you dabble into in this world because you can fall. You can fall away from God. Listen, we used to be so strong about preaching to the people, about getting them to follow the Lord and do what's right. Don't play with the edges. Don't play with the enemy. We want to see how close to the edge can I get without sinning. You've already sinned. Because you don't want to draw close to God. You want to draw close to the world and see what you can get away with and still be all right. What kind of Christian living is that, folks? You know, Remember, I, Dan? I don't, uh, I listen to a lot of music, but I don't listen to today's uh, religious music because they, they had uh, young people in their churches and say anything goes just to get in crowd and it's not spiritual music anymore. Yeah, yeah. There's 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 some of all kinds. Uh, you listen to a lot of Brianna. What? A lot of Brianna. Everybody listen to a lot of Brianna. Rihanna. Yeah. Super Bowl. Rihanna. What Rihanna? Rihanna. Oh, see, I don't even know her name. Thank the Lord, I don't even know her name. <laughs> Rihanna. Is it Rihanna? Yeah. The, you know, when they showed the uh, advertisements of her with her hair, you know, all uh, did she not look like Cindy Lou Who? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, I just, uh, that's the first thing that crossed my mind. Well, she looked like Cindy Lou Who, and guess what? She sang about Michael Who, in my opinion. I but all of it. I heard her like, oh, yeah. oh, I didn't yeah. talk for and see her. Right. It's vulgar. Vulgar to audiences that have children and families watching the Super Bowl. It's vulgar and devilish. Where is the church going to take their stand on this stuff? Mm -hmm. You want to uh, you want to sing like that? You want to act like that? I won't promote it and I won't ever buy a record. I won't ever go to a concert and I'm going to tell my church, don't you either. Right. Right. Where are we going to take this strong, clear cut stand? I'll tell you what we need to promote. We need to promote Lamar Hamlin. Because he, according to an article by, uh, by Associated Press, says that they say he has brought prayer back in sports that we were kind of tossing to the side, and now all of a sudden it's come back to the forefront where it belongs. People weeping and praying. Listen, did you guys see the Super Bowl National Anthem? How many saw the coach of the Eagles with the tears streaming down his cheeks? Yeah. Right. I ain't seen anybody doing this. I'm not standing for the flag. Right? No. Because the, the honorees of flipping the coin toss on that game was from Tillman who died in battle uh, for us that we could have the freedom in this nation. But listen, 
There's your stand. We need to jump on that way. So just as I need to say, don't you be listening to Rihanna and, and buying any of these kind of records. You shut her down. You make her think again about this devil worship and, and this devil idol stuff and all of this uh, of vulgar dancing and stuff. And you say, I'm going to back guys like Lamar Hamlin. I'm going to pray for him that God, listen, he still not said a thing about going back to football because he said, God has another plan for my life and I see it now. Now, he may go back to football sometime, but right now, he's all about just want to serve the Lord. And I hear all of these stories about these athletes now. And listen, they are, are this is the time for the church to jump on that. This clear-cut stand, pray, pray, pray. Quit praying after the students have been shot. Pray before them. Pray before every classroom. Before every time you meet at school. What happened to meet at the flag prayers that they used to have at these schools? We need those back. This might be our opportunity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to preach tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the things that are right. Keep yourselves. Listen, the battle is real. This battle. Anybody fought any battles like that? Anybody had? Listen. listen. <laughs> I'm trying to think of who said this. It could have been Billy Graham. I don't know. But one of those preachers said, there's two reasons I know the devil is real. Number one, the Bible says so. Number two, I've done demons with him. Mm -hmm. Listen, I mean, if you haven't battled the devil lately, you need to wake up because he's ready for the next fight. The battle is real. Have mercy. Listen, we need to have mercy. The children of Israel, before Jesus went to the cross, listen, you know what their cry was for the lost? God, how long before you just wipe them off the face of the earth? Get rid of them. They're worthless. You know what the cry of the Christian is today? Have mercy on their soul. And by the grace of God, draw them to you that they might be saved. Mm -hmm. So Jude is saying we need to have mercy. Save. Save all at all costs. Paul said, I become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. What does that mean? He became a drunk so he could win a drunkard. He became a male prostitute so he could reach prostitutes. No. What does it mean? <laughs> He <laughs> rose with the high people and he got down with the uh, poor people. Yeah. You know? He could talk to the beggar on the street in his love. Or he could talk to the dignitaries, the Felixes and the governors at their level. Right. And here you got the governor saying, almost thou persuade us to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. And then you got these down here at this level accepting Christ as well. He knew how to do whatever he had to be. Whatever circle he was in, whatever group he was in, he was going to present the gospel in some way that's doing all I can that somebody might come to know Jesus as their Savior. That's what it's really all about. It's, it's not about the, the, the yelling and the screaming and the jumping up and down and the sweating and the snorting and, and spitting out your teeth and all that kind of stuff. It's not about all that. It's about standing for what is right and doing what's right and reaching all that we can for Jesus. That's what it's all about. And then he ends it by saying, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, I wish we had time to talk about that, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. His closing was about our ultimate hope in an infinite God. So, I get rejected by the world because of my stand for Jesus. When I'm all done with this world, is that going to matter? But if I roll over and play dead because I don't make anybody mad, and then when I die and leave this world, is that going to matter? Yes. Yeah. I'm afraid that it doesn't weigh out. So, where should I stand? 
This is a great book, the book of Jude. If you've never read this book before, you should read it often. Go back in the Old Testament and look up these uh, things that he has mentioned through here and get even a better understanding of those things. Well, if but, you, you can't uh, read the book of uh, Jude and take with it the second uh, Peter, the second chapter, read them both together. That that's good. Good, yeah. good. So keep that. So somebody should jot that down in your notes. The Second Peter two and Jude. Read them together. Right. Take it personal, folks. You know the guy in the grocery store line swearing and all that. You know I took it personal. I didn't know God was going to make me take it that personal, but I took it personal. But then when I had to say something, you know. But here's what I said. You are tearing down someone that I love so much. <coughs> Listen, I, I never was a brawler. Even though, you know, I was a golden one boxer for about five years, but listen, I, I, I didn't send myself a brawler because I only had one accidental fight outside the ring. The rest of it was in the ring. I, I wasn't one of those just looking for a fight now that I'm a boxer, right? But now I'll also turn this on. I'll find here. Oh, it's personal. It was personal. So I, when I, I talked to somebody about the Lord, I talked to this guy about the Lord. Listen, it's because loving Jesus is personal. Do you have a, if you have that personal relationship with him, then it hurts you when these things happen. Oh, I know what I was going to say. I'm no brawler, but don't say something about my mom. <laughs> <laughs> I, could, I couldn't help myself. Now, that's back in my younger days, I'm, uh, and my mom was gone today, but don't say nothing about her either. She's in the grave. Well, she's with the Lord. But. Those are fine words, right? Because that's family. That's your blood. That's who raised you. Yeah, you can you can fight and argue with your mom all you want to, but the neighbor can't. That's the way we should feel about Jesus. Good preacher friend of mine in Salina, Kansas, one of the meanest guys in town got saved. He's always in jail. Always getting in bar fought fights and thrown in jail, and he always called trying to come and bail him out of jail. Trying to mess with his head. He always called him to bail him out of jail. And he goes, Look, I can't be bailing you out of jail. Why would you stay out of trouble? And kept on about the board. Finally, the guy gets saved. About two weeks after the guy's saved, he gets a call from the police station. He's in jail. He goes to the jail and he goes, What happened? He goes, Well, he said, I was talking to this man about the Lord. And he started bad mouth in our church. And he started bad mouth in our God. And then he started bad mouth in you, Brother Tryman. And then I just had to hit him. <laughs> so Tryman said, well, I hope you gave him a good one. <laughs> Listen, it's personal. It's, we need to start taking it personal. Know what you believe. So that you can defend the truth. That's Jude's message. We've let them slip in, and now look where we are. Stop it. Stand on truth. Defend the faith. Know what you believe, and then stop this nonsense, and you stand on the truth, no matter what falls out from it. I think it's good, keyed and one for us. Good study, folks. I, we ran over just a little bit tonight. I'm sorry, but I want to get this Jude in. And so let me just tell you that next week we'll look at Titus. So make sure you look at that three chapters, but we, we'll cover them too, not verse by verse like this. But, but we'll look at Titus because, I'm, again, I'm giving you the names that were given to me of what you wanted to study. So Jude, Titus, then we only have a couple more, and then we can open it up to whatever uh, you want to continue uh, studying. Uh, have these been good for you? I mean, uh, these Bible studies, this one is a little more different than the Bible studies we've had of, of, of a person, but because it was Jude's message that was important here.
we kind of got right off who Jude is, and, but it was his message that was that was really important to us. All right, any comments or questions about what we've uh, covered tonight that uh, you wanted to say, didn't say? Well, I thought it was interesting in verse 3 that he really wanted to talk to them about the faith, and he changed his mind and wrote about standing up for the truth. He said, I found it necessary to write a thing to you. I was eager to write about, he wanted to talk about salvation. Salvation. And he instead changed. Because this is needful. This is needful. Yeah. And I, and, and I like the words like earn. It, it could have just said, you should contend for the faith. But it said, earnestly contend for the faith. This is serious business. This is important. This is something we've got to set up in the chair and, and take a listen to. Uh, I don't want you to miss this. This is, yeah, good point. Anyone else? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. Your word that, <laughs> uh, it excites me, Lord. I, I'm not giving any apologies for it. But Lord, let it be something that stirs our hearts in the right way. And that we would take things more seriously and contend for that which is right and true. The world may not believe the word of God, but that doesn't make it any less true. Let us stand on it anyway. Let us do that which is right. Let us take it personal. Our relationship with you and living for you and seeing others come to know Jesus. Because that person who is against you has a bad end coming. I want to help them and share with them how they can have a good end. Lord, I just pray that you, you would convict our hearts and stir our hearts about these things. Thank you for Jude. Boy, he certainly got on fire when he got a hold of the Lord and, and, and believed with all of his heart. God, let us do the same. We ask it in Jesus' name. You're watching my Facebook. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Hope it's been a blessing to you. Don't forget to read Titus, and we'll see you, Lord willing, on Sunday morning.